Starting a motorcycle company out of your barn may seem like a bad idea, but when you look at Boltaco's history and the fact that they would go down as one of the great names in two-wheeled motorsport history with some of the most iconic and successful off-road motorcycles of all time, the company's rather rural origins kind of make sense. Our story starts not in America or England or Japan or even Italy, but rather in Spain. It was May of 1958, and a meeting for the board of directors of Montesa, the premier Spanish motorcycle manufacturer at the time, was underway in Barcelona. At this point, Montesa was known for making small displacement, lightweight street bikes, and perhaps more importantly, race bikes. Montesa's 125cc Grand Prix motorcycle had recently taken second, third, and fourth in the ultra-lightweight class at the Isle of Man. The two co-founders of the company were present at the meeting, Pede Permainer and Francesco Bolto. But Permainer had the support of the majority of the board, and he had an announcement to make. In light of recent struggles and the downturn in the Spanish economy, he had decided that Montesa should pull out of racing entirely, a difficult decision many a motorcycle manufacturer has had to make in hard times. Racing is very expensive and the profits aren't always obvious. Bolto, however, the sporting enthusiast at the company, voted against this move, and he was really in the minority. To his co-founder's surprise, Bolto ultimately decided to leave his position as lead designer of Montessa Motorcycles after they decided to leave racing, and soon after he decided to start his own company, made to compete with Montessa, but with an even more focused pursuit of motorcycle sport. Now I'm guessing you've probably heard the phrase, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Bolto followed a similar motto, a former racer himself, he would say that the market follows the checkered flag. Before he could go racing though with his new company, he would have to set everything up, and you rarely start a motorcycle company with a race bike. Alongside 12 technicians, many from Montessa's racing department who had left to join Bolto, they met at his country farmhouse to start the planning for an all-new 125cc single-cylinder two-stroke street bike made to really be kind of an alternative transportation option in Spain's ever-struggling economy. Not only were small bikes affordable, they were also the best option for traversing Spain's struggling transportation system. Post-war Spain was not unlike post-war Italy in this sense, and though at a smaller scale, Spain was a great place to produce small displacement motorcycles. Of course, Bolto had other plans for this model, it would need to be a starting place for racing because racing was the ultimate goal. Now just a month after that initial meeting, in July of 1958, Bolto and his team purchased an old farm on the northern edge of Barcelona and set up shop in its outbuildings. Now this was primitive stuff. Bolto was a wealthy person, but it takes an incredible chunk of money to start a motorcycle company the proper way, so they just did it the improper way. The team began taking their initial design, and they brought it to fruition on this farm, working out of literal tin roof barns. This was really primitive stuff. And just four months after starting the project, and only six months since that infamous meeting at Montesa where Bolto left, he and his little company had their first prototype motorcycle. While the team worked tirelessly to iron out the kinks and get the little 125 production worthy, word got out that a new motorcycle was coming to the market, so early in 1959, they decided to let the press come in and see what they were doing. But they'd been so focused on the motorcycle and on just making a great product, they'd forgotten to even name their company, and thus would be the birth of arguably the weirdest named motorcycle manufacturer ever, Boltaco. A mix of Bolto's real name, Bolto, and his nickname, Paco, Bull Taco. Now there's some debate about the origins of this name, but most would say this is how it came to be. At this point, they also decided that they needed a logo. Again, I just love the unassuming nature of all of this. So they created arguably an even goofier logo to match the goofy name, literally a thumbs up. Now this was in honor of Grand Prix racers and their common indication to their pits that things were going well. You know, thumbs up. And I like the meaning behind it, but it doesn't change the fact that it's just a thumbs up to the average person. And this thumbs up would often be splattered all over the motorcycle, much like the iconic Spanish car manufacturer Hispano Sueza in its day. A name like Boltaco, coupled with this odd logo, would be more of a hurdle to overcome in taking on the American market than anything else. The proof would really be in the pudding, however. And the pudding was this first motorcycle, the Trala 101. 
This little 125 fell comfortably in the sporting class, making 12 horsepower, capable of 71 miles per hour thanks to its sub 200 pound weight. Though it was no Grand Prix machine, it was rather advanced for its time, featuring a unit construction 4 speed gearbox, swinging arm suspension, solid, sporty ergonomics, and most importantly, it looked cool, which is no easy feat for a startup motorcycle manufacturer. I mean, Zero still has yet to make a good looking motorcycle. Now, shortly after its debut in 1959, Bolto's real intentions with all of this became clear when Boltaco entered its first team into the Clubman class for the Spanish Grand Prix, finishing 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, with 2nd place finishing a mere 6 inches behind Montessa's winning bike. Yes, Montessa went right back into producing race bikes. But in less than a year, Boltaco had made a competitive race machine. The Clubman class, however, wasn't the same as the main Grand Prix class for the 125s, but the team would take their first key win against real international competition in 1959 at Zaragoza, where the little Boltaco was initially entered into the production class, but forced to move over to the racing class because it was too loud. Now they were taking on the likes of the best race bikes from Ducati and MV Agusta, miraculously, rain began to fall and the fantastic handling little Boltacos dominated in the corners and ultimately won the race. With this victory over the very best in Grand Prix racing, it really gave them their first glimpse of what they were capable of. In 1960, Boltaco began expanding their two-stroke lineup, making some great, reliable road bikes, while simultaneously working to build a proper competitive race bike. That bike would go on to dominate the production race class in Spain through 1961, and it was around this time that Bolto decided to start working to build the Boltaco name internationally to really grow his company. At this point, they were pretty much just known in Spain. One way they would get their name out and really show what they were capable of would be in pursuit of some specific world records. The team built a 175cc two-stroke motorcycle with streamlined aerodynamics, built rather simply and traditionally, mainly for long-distance use and for reliability, and the bike performed better than expected on the racetrack in trying to get these records, running amazing for 10 hours averaging over 90 miles per hour. Then with some work to the bike, it was tested for 24 hours averaging over 80 miles an hour. Some of these records went beyond its own class, these numbers were better than the 250 and 350 cc class records. In all, Boltaco would take five world records, and this really helped put them on the map. Now, taking what they'd learned in research for this record-breaking motorcycle, they decided to build a production race bike known as the TSS. That bike would do well and even grab a few points in the Grand Prix class. Through the early 60s, Boltaco kept working to improve their street bikes, and they were really starting to make a name for themselves at this point. People were wondering, who is this small Spanish motorcycle startup? These incredibly simple two-strokes were competing on the world stage with the likes of Honda and MV Agusta. But as the 60s carried on, Bolto began to broaden his view of the future of his company by looking beyond just the road market. As street and race bikes became more and more advanced through the 60s, there was a sort of frustration among off-road enthusiasts for what was available. I mean, at this time, the best thing you could get for the dirt was pretty much a British bike. And though those bikes were easily modified to work, you know, on trails and in trials and on the dirt, they weren't specifically made to be dirt bikes. So 1964 would mark an important increase in sales for Boltaco, due mainly to the fact that they introduced all new off-road models known as the Sherpa. The Sherpa S would find its home in motocross competition, but bikes like the Sherpa T would absolutely revolutionize trials racing in Europe, literally overnight. Prior to this motorcycle, British bikes dominated the sport, but the lightweight, powerful two-strokes of Boltaco really showed a better way to do trials and basically rendered the big British twins and singles pretty much obsolete. A big British four-stroke bike weighed you know, probably over 350 pounds at this point, and these bikes just had no chance against Boltaco's lightweight, powerful two-stroke setup, designed in partnership with Sammy Miller, the legendary trials racer, who really was fed up with the British offerings at this point. Between him and Boltaco and the Sherpa T, they would pretty much win virtually every major trials and really help to grow Boltaco's name throughout Europe. 
Though the company was still finding success in road racing, especially among privateers, I mean the little bull taco road racers were the way to go if you wanted to win at that level. Despite all that, bull taco was starting to find its home on the dirt, beyond just trials with the Sherpa S models. But in 65, they would take their motocross platform to the next level with ongoing improvements to their smaller dirt bikes. Also, they started making Enduros, but it was with a model known as the Persang that Bull Taco would blow the mind of the American dirt bike scene. As motocross began to take over, a new kind of off-road motorcycle really became the standard, one that was purpose-built to be as light as possible with dirt performance as really the sole intention. Boltaco was at the very forefront of this push through the early and mid-60s, and they would pave the way for much larger manufacturers to stop trying to force their street bikes to be dirt bikes and actually make dedicated dirt bikes. I mean, there is no Honda Elsinore or Yamaha DT1 without motorcycles like the Boltaco Persang. All of Boltaco's two-stroke dirt bikes through the late 60s and into the 70s sat right around... 200 to 250 pounds, including that 250cc Persang. The combination of high power and low weight was really difficult to beat at this time. These bikes made about 35 horsepower, which really is plenty and a lot for this time. They had five speed gearboxes. The Persang was an absolute fire breather, and it was the formula for success lightweight, high power, high ground clearance with a good amount of fork travel in the suspension, and perhaps maybe even more important, right out of the crate, this bike was competitive. You didn't have to take it and double your expenses to make it race worthy. It was a race bike right out of the box, and in many ways, it was the first of its kind. Thanks to these off-road offerings, Boltaco was able to sell over 20,000 bikes in 1966, The old farm where manufacturing had started was now a full-blown factory, and though the dirt would prove to be Boltaco's market in terms of sales, they were still improving their bikes for road racing. That same year, Boltaco took their only win in Championship Grand Prix Racing at Ulster, taking the 1, 2, and 3 position in the 250cc class, and taking 7th that year in the 250cc championship. By 1968, Boltaco now repped a 21-model lineup, with street, but mostly dirt offerings. Bolto had decided years earlier that the future of the company would be in off-road bikes. Mostly these were still small motorcycles, but everyone knew that they performed well. This same year in 68, the El Bandito motocross model was released. Even by today's standards, this is a pretty crazy dirt bike. It made 43 horsepower at 7,500 RPM and weighed only 251 pounds. This bike was way ahead of its time. It featured things like a fiberglass fuel tank and fenders. For many, this bike was too much, though. Few riders could handle it, and the Persang would prove to really be the sweet spot for off-road performance. It weighed significantly less and was much easier to handle. Even today, we know this to be true. It takes a special kind of talent to handle the biggest, fastest motocross race bikes, and that was definitely true of the El Bandito. Now, as they had with Sammy Miller on the trials side, Boltaco convinced a little-known American motocross rider named Jim Pomeroy to try out a Boltaco Persang for the Motocross World Championship. At that point, this was dominated by European riders. By the early 1970s, Boltaco had garnered a respectable reputation in the motocross world, but they really were eager to achieve international recognition and elevate their brand status. Pomeroy's partnership with Boltaco proved to be a pivotal moment in both his career and also Boltaco's history. Boltaco's innovative engineering and Pomeroy's exceptional riding skills became an amazing combination that would redefine the dynamics of motocross. Pomeroy's natural ability to extract the maximum potential from the Boltaco motorcycles made him a formidable force on the track. Now, the pinnacle of this partnership came in 1973 at the 250cc Spanish Grand Prix. Pomeroy, the clearest of underdogs, ended up winning on his private bull taco, becoming the first rider in motocross Grand Prix history to win his debut race. This groundbreaking triumph not only cemented Pomeroy's legacy, but also showcased bull taco's engineering prowess going forward. In response, the bull taco factory decided to hire him to stay in Europe to compete in the 250cc motocross world championship, and in the end, he took 7th in the standings. And all of this really helped Boltaco gain global recognition as a manufacturer, 
capable of producing competitive motorcycles that could clinch victories at the highest levels of the sport. As Bolto says, the market follows the checkered flag, and Boltaco's dedication to innovation combined with Pomeroy's unwavering commitment to excellence not only earned them respect, but also really solidified their place in motocross history. But there were problems as the 1970s carried on. This decade would mark massive changes at every level in the motorcycle market, thanks to the international Japanese takeover. As much as Boltaco was an innovative company at every level, they would fall victim to a similar fate as the British industry, though for slightly different reasons. Despite making arguably some of the best performing motorcycles in their respective areas, namely small production road racers, but especially off-road trials and motocross and dirt bikes, even the dirt bike segment would eventually fall to Japanese dominance. Companies like Boltaco and especially Mako were forces to really be reckoned with in motocross, but simply put, there would be no hope if Yamaha and Honda took a real stab at building their own off-road race bikes, and as many of you know, that's exactly what happened. It wouldn't necessarily be about performance specifically. Through the 1970s, Boltaco still made some of the fastest dirt bikes that money could buy. Other factors would really be their downfall. For example, how could something like a Persang really compete with, say, a Honda Elsinore? When you could buy an Elsinore for a fraction of the price, have significantly better reliability and quality control, and let's say something does go wrong, the support is right down the road in the form of, you know, your local Honda dealer. It also doesn't help that the American economy as a whole was in decline due to the oil crisis starting in 73, and as we saw just a few years ago, sometimes when the economy struggles, the world runs to off-road hobbies, and getting a fun, fast, reliable dirt bike could be had for so little money thanks to companies like Honda. Struggles at home also didn't help the matter. Spain was in a massive transition to democracy at this point, and workers' unions were gaining more power. Boltaco wasn't exempt from things like strikes, and they experienced various periods of closure where they just couldn't produce anything, and ultimately, the inability to bring certain new necessary models to the market would mean that 1980 would mark the end of Boltaco. In light of everything coming against this company, though, in the end, it really would prove to be a bit of a miracle that they held on through the 70s as long as they did. Boltaco really did experience lots of successes even amidst the Japanese takeover because they did keep making great, arguably some of their greatest bikes, especially in the off-road segment, and they had some of their best wins in motocross through the 70s. Bikes like the Alpina and Matador, if you had a bit more money and you wanted a truly special dirt bike that felt very purpose-built and was really reliable, Boltaco was still the best for many of these years. In terms of actual manufacturing and design, the 70s were their peak, despite declines in sales. And I think this goes back to Bolto's original spirit and his pursuits with the Boltaco company. Whether they were making a production race bike for budding racers in the early 60s through Europe, or a trail bike for a hobbyist in America in the 70s, or a full-blown motocross bike for their works racers, these motorcycles were exactly what you would expect from a small company that was truly passionate and that's making really everything in-house. A high level of craftsmanship with just a touch of pizzazz that you just can't get from a company that's mass-producing millions of motorcycles every year. Think the difference between, say, you know, a Honda today and an MV Agusta. Though the Boltaco story would come to an all-too-familiar end, I think it's important to remember companies like Boltaco and what they represent. From the very beginning, this was a unique company that was very purpose-driven and refreshingly pure as an entrepreneurial venture. Lesser men than Bolto not only would have never gotten the thing going in the first place, in the face of competition, they would have killed the company much earlier. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this history of kind of a lesser-known company, but a really important motorcycle company in terms of history. Let us know if you guys have any experience with Bull Tacos, as I'm sure some of you guys rode these growing up. And yeah, we'll see you guys in the next video. Ride safe.